it is, however, really profoundly focused on on connection, on something larger than themselves, some insight into I'm not alone, and this all has meaning. Welcome to Profoundly Pointless. My name is Nick. In this episode, we're going to look at one of the biggest questions of them all. What happens after we pass? Our guest this episode is a clinical psychiatrist and afterlife researcher who specializes in near-death experiences and afterlife communications. We're going to talk about what's real, what's not, and what the latest science says about what comes next. This is afterlife researcher Dr. J. Kim Penberthy. Thank you for joining us. Like and subscribe if you get a chance. It keeps the show going. So kind of getting started off with the basics. How common would you say are after-death or near-death experiences for people? They are probably more common than people might realize. And you have to remember, we're talking about two different things when we're talking about a near-death experience. This is a very well-defined concept that we have that is um, specifically referring to an experience someone has when they die or nearly die and the subsequent sort of um, experiences that they have and recall. And in an after death communication, this is just exactly what it sounds like. This is um, having been contacted spontaneously by someone who has died in some way. And so when someone reports an after death communication, it is literally someone that they knew or had knowledge of who passed away and now they perceive um, they are being contacted by this person. If we were to put, I'm a big numbers person, right? And approximating 25% of people, 50% of people, 75, like what would you say is the reported number? And then what do you think is like, okay, but I think actually this many people have this happen. Obviously, with near-death experiences, it's it's smaller because it's constricted to people who have near-death experiences who almost die. And of those people, it's it's a fairly small percentage who actually remember and can describe what happened to them when they died. For after-death communications, so in that area, we see when we ask people, sort of go out and do random uh, research and find out you know, just asking them if they've had these experiences, it's it's all over the place. It can be between about 25% of the population up to 60%. So you have to remember, not everyone is going to um, endorse this. They might experience it, but not share with uh, other people. And when we've done research explicitly asking people if they've had any kind of communication like this, um, they will say yes and share their story and then disclose that they've never told anybody, certainly not a doctor or a psychologist. Um, and you can imagine why <laughs> they think that someone's going to think they're crazy or that they're making it up um, or hallucinating. So my hunch to answer the last part of your question is that people experience this at higher rates than we, than we probably know. So I think in, in reality, it's, it's the majority of people. That's my honest feeling. If you really ask things like people saying, well, I saw this Cardinal and mom always said, you know, she loved Cardinals. And I feel, I believe this Cardinal was mom coming back to check on me. If you include things like that in after death communications, which we do, you know, you can begin, you start thinking about your own life, the people you know, your relatives, your friends, many of them endorse experiences like this and don't think it's weird. That's, that would be, you know, the question that would jump out at me. And I'll use an example from, from my personal life. Um, my mother passed, I go on this hike to kind of clear my head, long hike, I get up to the central point of the hike, cloudy all the time, I get up to the top and the sun comes out. And I guess you could read that, depending on how you believe, two ways, right? Like, this is a sign. My mother is wherever. Or like, it's just a complete coincidence. Like, how do you kind of separate between those two? 
you know, that's a really good question and it can be tough. And a lot of it boils down to the interpretations and beliefs of the individual. So there might be someone who believes it was just pure coincidence and thinks nothing of it. Uh, oh, you know, this, the clouds burned off. It's that time of day. And this makes sense to me. And, and that's what they'll go with. And others, you know, again, it depends on the timing. It depends on the belief may say, yes, you know, that's, that's my mother telling me she's here with me. And in some ways, you know, again, it does depend on what people report, how they interpret it. As a clinical psychologist, which, which is what I am in my background, I'm way more interested in how it impacts people. Because the reality is it could be both, you know, and, and we've often lost the sight of, of, okay, you know, maybe it's ambiguous, maybe it's both, maybe, yeah, the, the clouds burned off and the sun came up because time passed. And who knows, maybe it's some sort of communication um, from the other side to reassure you. And, and to me, the important thing is the impact it has on you. Does that make you feel better? Does it help you cope with your grief? Does it make you feel like you're not alone? Those are important things. And if it helps to do that, then, uh, you know, I'm less worried about whether you can, you call it a real after death communication or not. That makes sense, right? Because I'm not a religious person. I'm not a spiritual person, but it does make me happy in a way. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I guess mm -hmm. kind of, but is there a, is there a, I'll just use the phrase dark side to that kind of thing, right? Like, okay, it makes somebody happy. So what? Leave them alone. But can this go negative where people obsess or it, it weighs down on them rather than lifting them up. Well, I mean, I think you can ask that of any kind of belief system. You know, you think about any structured religion, can it go sideways? Oh, yeah. <laughs> we've seen yeah, that. We've seen yeah. that. Yeah. It can be used against people, it can be manipulated. So, yes, that's definitely a possibility. Um, and that's, you know, that would be an interesting line of research to look at. Um, we do know that in the after death communication research, when we've explored that, there are people who feel like they've been contacted and had experiences and they were sort of, um, you know, not real um, positive for them. So it might have been sort of alarming or um negative in some way with, you know, their affect is impacted in a negative way. However, what we do find in the literature, in the research is that for the majority of people, and I'm talking, you know, about 75% or higher, uh, maybe 85% even, it is uh, genuinely, uh, general, gen, sorry, generally seen as a positive thing. So they feel that it is demonstrating to them that there is something beyond, that someone is still connected to them, sort of that continuation of the connection. And for many of them, they decrease their fear of death and dying, which can be very beneficial for folks. Um, we also found in a, a recent study that looked at about almost a thousand people that People who have after-death communications um, generally become more spiritual, not re religious necessarily. So we looked at that difference between religiosity, which is practicing in a more formal religion, whether or not you go to church or synagogue or something, um, versus spirituality, which was a little more uh, a little more personalized, if you will. So your research is focused more on the idea that people have this not necessarily trying to prove that these things are really exist or not. It's more the idea right. of like, this is a commonality that people have. Yes. Um, because in my, in my role as a clinical psychologist, you know, I'm not an astrophysicist. I'm not a theoretical physicist. I'm not, I am not that smart. I tell you what. So I work with people and um, a lot of my work is with people who have very serious illness. I work with oncology patients, people who are 
really facing their own death. And many of them have significant fear of death and dying. This is very problematic. I've seen many very bad deaths, which are just heartbreaking. It's it's hard enough to work with someone who is actively dying and then to work with someone who's dying and denying it or fighting it um, because of fear. Um, so I look to this work as a way to help improve the quality of life for people um, as, as one of the objectives. So really how it's the sort of, so what question these happen. So what, you know, we can go the route of looking at the, the, the science of it, the, the, the physics of it, or the, uh, you know, the uh, theology of it, or we can look at what's the impact right here, right now, whether or not we know much more about these. So in, in some ways, you know, it, it's interesting to look at all of that as a clinician with my clinician hat on, I'm really looking at the impact. How does this impact people? How does it make their lives better? How does it make their death um, a better death, so to speak? Um, so that's sort of where I'm at with the after death communication research. Is there like people who report after death experiences, near death experiences, after death communications, do they fit into a kind of a category, right? Like, are they, is it mostly men, mostly women, mostly religious people, mostly spiritual people? Like, do they ultimately kind of trend in a certain direction? Well, here's what's interesting. When, when you look at after uh, people who report after death communications, it is global. There are people around the world that report this. So it is, it's universal. And um, we see it most commonly, obviously, in, in people who have someone who passed away fairly recently. So it's most often seen in people who've had someone they love pass away within the year. It is more common in women. There again, we don't really know if that's a true statistic, or if it's just that women tend to um, endorse these things more than men um, in general, they sort of self-report things like this more psychological components, um, emotions, that sort of thing. So um, the answer is really, it, it happens universally and across time. I mean, you can find reports of these in, you know, as far back as the Bible and earlier Greek writings and things like that. So it seems to be something that humans have um, experienced since the beginning of humanity. You specialize in after-death communication. So an after-death communication is text message, I'm assuming, is not a, not a text message from Uncle Bob, I'd right? But be surprised, <laughs> um, you know. Um, so typically... The, we think about the various categories and, and obviously you can be contacted in different ways, visually, what we might think of as, as an apparition or like we were talking about the sun coming out or a cardinal, you know, something that signif uh, signifies the loved one who's passed away. It can be um, a voice, a hearing words. And that includes, you know, some people get phone calls that are like sort of staticky um, or, or happen and, and they attribute it again. This is all what they attribute it to. This is my mother calling. Some feel a, a, a presence. So they just feel the sense that someone's in that person's in the room with them. They smell aromas. You might smell their perfume touch. You can also feel the, you know, the hand on the face or a hand on your shoulder. So all of these ways can be um, ways that we experience an after-death communication. I think the thing that jumps out too, right, for skeptical people, they could just be like, guys, just a missed phone call, right? <laughs> like, is that difficult from a research perspective to kind of be like, well, you know what? Maybe you, like, ah, I got a phone call from my mother after I've been drinking all night. Like, well... Maybe it's because you were drinking all night, right? Like, is it difficult to kind of, do you have to, how do you take into account those things where that maybe jump out and like, well, maybe this was happening? Yeah. Well, it, it's interesting you bring this up because we don't, you know, we don't typically have people knocking down our doors to tell us about these experiences. 
So you do have to consider the source, obviously. And um, many people uh, are sort of hesitant and a little reluctant and take a little, you know, bit of feeling safe and, and being invited to share these things. So I think that's one thing to keep in mind. There is a bit of a hurdle to get over for these folks. And, and of course, you're right. Um, there can be um, people who tell us these things and we may think it's a different kind of attribution, you know, like that seems more like a missed phone call to me. Again, I'm going to go back to what does this individual believe and why might it be important and how could it be helpful? Um, you also have to distinguish, you know, between people with true thought disorders. So there are people who have thought disorders, like people with schizophrenia, um, who have, you know, delusions or psychotic thoughts. Um, and what we found in the research is that the people who report after death communications are, are not psychotic. They do not have thought disorders. So there is a big difference there. And we do look at that research. So um, we're talking about people who don't, they, they may be grieving, they might have some anxiety or other sort of symptoms like many of us do um, when we've lost someone. However, they don't have a thought disorder. So I think it is important to clarify that. When you look at the, I believe if I looked at, there was like 12 kinds of, 12 main categories mm -hmm. of after death communications. Is there one or two that are much more prevalent than other ones? Yeah, I, I would say, um, you know, you, you can look at the research sort of varies depending on the sample that you look at. Um, I think it's very common for people to sense a presence of someone. Um, and I think part of that may be because it's, it's sort of general enough that you know, it's, it's, uh, it seems more accessible, maybe. It's both specific enough and vague enough that kind of can categorizes anything. Or yeah. like, yeah, yeah, you just kind of feel like somebody is there with you. Yeah. And we all know what that feels like, which is also interesting. Um, so is, is there any research, though, that would suggest that, you know what, like, this is just a brain coping mechanism? Yeah, and there are people who who argue that um, I don't know. Again, that's not my specific area of expertise, um, and I'm not very aware of any research that has said yes, this is where you know where that happens in the brain, and that's what's going on. Um, it's certainly a hypothesis. More, uh, what's more common is a hypothesis that these are just sort of wishes. Um, and um, as you sort of alluded to, like, I want to, I want to believe this. So then I imbue it with this attribution. I say that, yes, this is what it is. And again, that's sort of challenging to, um, to d sort of tease apart. Well, then what does that mean? Is this real? Is it not? It's real to the individual person. Um, one of the things we can do, and this may be what you're sort of trying to get at is, for some of these, we can look at um, sometimes information is passed, the location of missing items or some information. And if that is reported to us through this after death communication from the individual who had it, we could go back and then look at, at verifying this information. Um, so there are some cases of that where you look at the information and determine if it's true or not. And some of them have been shown to be valid. So at that point, you know, again, that's a little bit more proof. You still have naysayers who say, well, it could be luck. It could be. So you could still argue against that as proof. However, we do know that we've seen those instances it where does, some information has passed. It does seem yeah. like something that like, no matter what, you could pick holes apart. There's how did you kind of get into it? What made you focus on this area? Well, um, I've always been very open to, uh, you know, all kinds of ideas. As a young person, I was very curious and um, I had wonderful parents that really encouraged that. And, and I had, you know, a, a strong sense of science. My father was a surgeon, my mother a nurse, and she probably would have been, I don't know, some 
some mystic leader if she knew about that. Uh, she was very uh, into nature and and um, and and sort of this open spirituality and and um, growing up, I would ask them both things because they're 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 their answers were so different. It was so fun. You know, I asked my dad, what is the purpose of life as a little kid? Cause I, I just had these ideas of, you know, I, I wanted to find out. He said, well, that's easy. And I was like, wow. Okay, great. I didn't expect that. He said, it's to reproduce. Cause as a scientist, <laughs> yeah, that is the purpose, <laughs> right. right? Okay. And I asked my mom the same question separately. And she said, Oh, that is so easy. Again, I'm like, yes. She said, it's love. And so I then asked them, well, what happens when you die? And my dad proceeded to say, again, this is easy. Here you go. You ready? Starts to tell me all about how the systems shut down and the decomposition of the of the body. How old were you? <laughs> and, <laughs> Six year old. And um, I asked my mom the same, and she said, "Oh, that's easy. You reunite with love. It's eternal love." And so, I grew up with these thoughts, and and that they they are compatible. That they're totally compatible. And so, I went into psychology because I thought people were fascinating. I loved how we can hold multiple thoughts in our head, and you know. Um, and the creativity we have, the genius we have, the kindness we have, as well as the darker side of that. And very fascinated in, in what impacts that, how that develops, how it can change, what you can do for people to help them. And um, became a clinical psychologist. And I think it was also informed by experiences I had as a young person. And even in my 20s, that's when I had an experience that really impacted me and um, made me realize that I, I, I don't have all the answers and there are things going on that I don't understand. And, um, and there may be, may be pretty positive things. So if you'll indulge me, I'll, I'll yeah, share yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Um, my mother and I love the beach. I did not grow up at the beach, but we always went to um, the outer banks of North Carolina um, and, would were there one summer it was just my mother and I and I was probably in my late teens or early 20s I don't know why it was just the two of us and she went in for a swim we had been sort of laying in the sand and I just laid I had a towel over my face just to protect it and dozed off I'm pretty sure and woke up to sort of a, a you know the noise of a crowd on the beach and so got up on my um, elbows to look and I saw a big crowd at the water's edge. And I saw that the lifeguard um, and this other man were bringing my mother in from the ocean. Um, and she looked okay. She was standing up and everything. Um, so I, I, I just felt like, okay, I don't need to rush over there. There's plenty of people. She looks fine. But it was curious to me. I noticed that the, the man, the one, not the lifeguard, the other man looked older and he was like in regular clothes, not beach clothes, like a short sleeve button down shirt and, and khaki pants. And, um, I didn't recognize him. And, um, so then she came up to the, to the blanket and lay down. She said she was fine. Don't worry. And so after we both laid down, we we're both there with our eyes closed. And I said, well, mom, who was that other guy? Who was he? And she said, oh, that was my grandfather. And to this day, I still get chills. Um, she had grown up in in a sort of a challenging home environment and was raised primarily by her grandfather, who just adored her and, and really um, cherished her. And um, I never met him. I didn't even know what he looked like. But then when we returned home, I happened. We never really talked about it again. I mean, it was just not a big deal to her. It was like, well, that happened. Okay. And I just followed her cues. Like, yeah, like, I mean, that's, that's what you do. When you know, you're at that age, right? right yeah. Right. And, um, when I came home, I, you know, start digging around 
And sure enough, I found a picture of him and it, it was him. And I was like, oh, that's the man I saw. I couldn't believe it. So again, I didn't go telling everybody. I just really sort of kept it here. And, and it opened up this part of me that was thinking, you know, there's so much more than we know. How can I explain that? Especially in my science mind, you know, I'm in, I'm getting ready to go to college and, you know, study science and biology. And, and, and so I've always, that's, that's really driven me great, a great deal. And, and you, you know, is that an after death communication? Sort of, is it a ghost? I guess, you know, I, I didn't call it that. I still don't. I, I really think of it as some, you know, we know that in, in times of crisis, things like this can happen. Our, our sense of our consciousness can become altered. I mean, you can think of this as sort of an altered state of consciousness that I'm now accessing some other piece of reality, um, you know, where this is now sort of uh, apparent to me or evident to me in a way. Um, so I, I guess I sort of conceptualized it like that and um, kept it with me and, and have, um, have thought more and more about it as I've gone into this work. And maybe it Im impacted me in, in going into this direction more than I realize. Um, not sure. That's kind of my personal opinion about, I would say, I'll use the word stuff like this, right? Is that it doesn't matter if it's real or not. It's real to you. And mm -hmm. it does, I mean, obviously it's an incredibly powerful experience. Does it change people's lives? Would you say like, like oh, oh wow. yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So people definitely, you know, and, and, and this includes things like near death experiences and out of body experiences which often come with near death experiences. I mean, we can have out of body experiences anytime. We can do that through meditation or some people sort of spontaneously do, some people do in a time of crisis. All of these sort the the hypothesis is number 1, they they do impact you. They change your outlook. They often uh, people endorse that they are more spiritual with all that that means to them. Maybe they're they feel more connected to people, they feel like there is something bigger than themselves. They feel like there's a purpose. Many people experience a very intense, positive affect, some sort of, some knowledge that everything is okay, that it's all the way it should be, sort of this profound equanimity um, that is obviously very, very um, helpful in living your life when you feel connected, supported, that you're supposed to be here, that your life is moving the way it should. Those all help people feel much more safe, more connected, um, more productive. Um, and also, interestingly, simultaneously reduce the fear of death. So I can be engaged in my life fully and really embrace it and also accept that, that there is this other phase of it called death. And it's it doesn't have to be terrifying. Are you ready for some harder slash listener submitted questions? Sure. I'm one of those people like I don't transition well. I just do it. Sounds good. Let's get right into one of the hard ones. What do you think we fear more? Death or not knowing what happens next or if something happens next? So... Uh, interestingly, uh, for that question, it's a really good question. I'm going to add a third choice in there. What the research shows people fear most is the pain of dying, the process of dying. You know, think about it, a prolonged agonizing death. When we've done research, this is the thing that most people fear the most. That is the exact opposite of what I want. My dream is to be eaten by a bear. I want to experience, I want to experience the whole thing, like every second have, of it. I have never heard anyone say that. That's that's impressive. I, I I don't I don't know what to make with that though. I <laughs> I want to know what it's like, right? It's the last thing you were like. 
man, that was pretty bad. But I, this is the way I've always thought about it. Like if everybody's in the afterlife and they're all sitting around the table, like I went in my sleep, I had this, I had that. I got eaten by a bear. That's the person like, that's a good story. <laughs> the end. Okay, there's my personal thing aside. Um, do you think though that like, okay, if there is an afterlife, would it then make our lives less valuable? Well, and, and I, you know, I think afterlife is sort of a, an interesting term. Different belief systems think of it differently. So, you know, yes, sort of Christian, sort of the Abrahamic religions, some of them have this sort of sense of an afterlife, not all of them, but uh, that, that, you know, we go to heaven or we do something. There's another phase. And there's also a sense of, well, what if this is a, a sort of a reconnection with something larger? So we sort of, you know, our individual selves, we're so used to thinking of that in our culture, but that we're really just part of this larger thing. And a little piece has come into this body for this period of time and then reunites with this larger consciousness. There's a way of looking at that as well. Um, I think it's an interesting question, you know, does it make this life less, what was the word, valuable? Valuable or, or pressing or whatever, right? Does it, and, I'll use the word, be overly dramatic, like cheapen this life. Like, all right, well, I'm just doing this until I do this thing. And I think there is a risk for, for that. You know, you do see people in, again, certain very extreme religions where, this life is all about just getting to the next. And those are often in, in sort of um, these religions where, where we are sort of waiting for the next big thing, so to speak, uh, you know, and there can be a risk of that. That's where you get people who are willing to, you know, commit suicide and, and do things to move on to that next level. Um, so I think that's more of a risk than thinking about this as sort of a cheapened version uh, because again, it's interesting that many, if you think about it, many people that that have these experiences actually value this life more. So the, the research would seem to contradict that, um, even though it is a risk, you know, that that we could sort of diminish this life and think of this as less important. Interestingly, the research would show people who have near-death experiences, who have after-death communications or even out-of-body experiences, find that they value this life more, that this is, the, you know, that they have more positive affect. And part of it is that we suspect is that they understand some sort of shift happens in their consciousness, that they understand they're not alone, they are connected, that, that they're already that way, you know. Yeah, I could see more. I could see where people who are more spiritual, more naturey, would feel that way more, right? Because the idea, like, if you're super into nature, you know that the trees are connected to the grass, to the animals, right? And a lot of collective societies, um, also, that you know, that I think we're so used to thinking of, of being independent of our own, you know, in America, it's all about the individual and our rights and our, and there's nothing wrong with that, except there are cultures, we forget where it is all about the collective and, and where people's minds just much more naturally go to that, that it's we, not me. Um, and that's a we as in my community, my society, my country, this is another level of we as in, you know, all of consciousness, all of creation. That's the one thing that I want to happen when I die. I just want somebody to be like, hey, this is what happens. Like this is, here you go. Like this is what happens. They should give you like a pamphlet. I feel like you should get a brochure explaining <laughs> like how this all works. Right. I agree. I agree. <laughs> I just hope that, you know, being eaten by a bear doesn't mean you become the bear that gets uh, to heaven. I don't know. I wondered about that. that. Is... You know, if you're consumed by another creature, do you go as the bear or do you go as Nick? That is know? a good question. Either way, though, I feel okay with it, right? Like I could be half bear, half person. Would make, you know, God, you could have some, that would be an interesting time. Yeah, that would be a God, it's story. so interesting to think about like all the possibilities, like what could happen.
The other thing that I would like to happen is like somebody to say like, you know what, if you would have made this decision here, this is where you would have been. Like a life review. If you would have mowed the lawn at one o'clock instead of 12 o'clock, you would have won the lottery that day. Like what? <laughs> All yeah. these things are yeah. so cool. Um, do you personally believe in an afterlife? I mean, you know, I, I have had, ex I have had experiences that have allowed me to perceive that there is more out there than we currently think about in our modern day science. I'll say that, you know, um, modern day science is pretty materialistic uh where you know you're you're in your body your brain is what produces all this stuff and then when your brain dies and your body dies you're gone i don't know if i buy that i will say that um what what is the alternative i'm still exploring i i think there are um other possibilities and that to some extent, we can research them. Um, I'm very interested in how we can research what these beliefs mean to people and how they impact the quality of their life, how they treat other people, um, how they treat the earth, that sort of thing. So for me, I guess it's less important to find the ultimate answer and maybe more important to think about, well, what are the implications here and now for our world? and for individuals. Do you think, okay, what do you think would impact the world more if we found out absolutely with like 100% proof that yes, there is, or 100% proof that no, there isn't? I think, first of all, not everyone's going to believe everything, but if we go hypothetically, personally, I think it would be far more tragic to put out there uh that that idea that this is all it is that it we're just material and when we die that's it we had no sort of consequence we're not connected to anything larger there was really no meaning in our life i think that would be really hard i think um it would probably have a much more negative impact yeah i feel like we would start destroying the world really yeah don't accidentally prove it the other way. Um, yeah, that's one of those things like we like you should probably keep that to yourself if you accidentally discover that. Like let's just go ahead and not put that information yes. out there. What do like how do other how do you you know other researchers view it? Is it like if you go to the convention, are they kind of like, "Oh boy, here comes the near death people?" Or are they like how do they view how do they view that research? Well, uh, I, I have not been shunned. I, I, I will tell you that. So that's number one. Um, there are a couple answers to that. So yes, I do. I do mainstream research as well. What we would call mainstream research. Um, coming up through my career, I did a lot of research in chronic depression and addiction. Um, and then working of course with, uh, oncology patients and, and really started doing meditation research early on when it was fringe and have seen that become more mainstream. And yes, sometimes you would have the people eye rolling or whatever. The, the key really is to do very good science, you know, do good research, um, make it quality so that people can look at the research and say, yes, I see how you did this. This is standard operating procedure type of thing. And, and then it's, it's more difficult for people to dispute. The other thing is, you know, uh, as more people do this research and I'm invested in training people and spreading the word, then, then it becomes um, validated. So more people in different labs are doing it and, and finding out answers. And we also have developed conferences that are, you know, like many things, you develop specialty conferences. So um, when it was not always well received in, in may maybe other conference centers, um, you could go to one that focused on after death studies or um, palliative care, things like that, where you're looking at um, people who run into this all the time, who literally see this in their work um, and it's important to them. So I think that as we do more and do quality research, it, it may 
it may go the way of, of meditation where it becomes more and more mainstream and people see the value, not so much, you know, with, with meditation, it's, it's, it was really developed from some of the ancient work, not to be so much like, here's a way of life. Here's the spiritual path you have to take like Buddhism or something. It was, it was developed in a way to say, how can we help people? And that may be part of why it became accepted because people did quality research and saw the positive impact initially really working with chronic pain patients and, and people like that where there was nothing else to, to help. Um, so, so we may see this develop in a similar way. How can we help people with severe fear of death and dying? Um, having some exposure to thoughts about, you know, after death communication or out of body experiences can help reduce that. We know from the research. So we, we may see it continue to grow. It does seem like the kind of thing that I could see somebody like the most skeptical person in the world at the same time being like, this is absolute blah, blah, blah. And then pulling you aside and being like, hey, this thing happened to me the other day. That does happen. Um, so people um, have disclosed their own experiences and how profoundly it impacted them. Um, they still usually report that they can't come public with it because of the fear of, you know, a stigma attached to it, um, or they're early in their career and they need to, you know, build up their career before they move into that area. Um, so, yeah. This would be the last question that we got. What after death communication or near death experience stands out to you the most besides your own, obviously. There are so many, there are so many, one really amazing one to me um, was interesting because it was the first one I heard where it was it was a sort of a more harsh uh, version. Um, we often think of loving and supportive and you know very touching type of encounters. And this was a gentleman who was struggling with uh, alcohol addiction. And we'd been working a long time, and he was not making much pro progress. And um, I was, I had taught him meditation. And, you know, early on when I was doing the meditation work, a lot of these experiences came from people learning to meditate and practicing their meditation. And then they would report some of these unusual experiences. He had, a, uh, and what he considered, he called it some sort of communication from um, someone that he felt connected to, but he, he didn't really know who they were, but he felt a sense that they were connected. And it was this voice, this very harsh female voice who was telling him to get his shit together and stop being, you know, a baby and just get on board. And he needed to quit drinking or he was going to die. So it was clearly not him. It was not his own thoughts. He said, no, it's, I've had those thoughts. I know that stuff. This was someone else coming to me and I heard them plain as day. This is what they told me. Now he was not psychotic. He did not have a thought disorder. He was not actively drinking excessively where he would have had some sort of delusion. He changed overnight because he said that that, that communication knew him, got him and that it, resonated with him. And, um, I, you know, I've not heard many stories like that, um, where someone comes back and scolds you so harshly and says pretty harsh things to you. Um, and you attribute it to someone that, that is invested in you, but you don't know them. So that was, that was a little odd and bizarre. What I was most impressed with was the impact. I mean, it worked and I, I, I can tell you, I swear, we had worked for, for so long to help him reduce his intake and he just quit. Just right there, um, right? And didn't pick it up again. Um, the last communication I had with him, he was still not drinking. And, um, you know, so what was that? I may never know. It was important to him. It came through his active work on, on his meditation, on altering his consciousness, on sort of expanding. And I suspect it was some sort of contact with some awareness maybe that was within him, maybe from external. Um, and, and it was just some point he had to get to and maybe some 
some point he had to get to in his work with me, in addition to some opening up with some, maybe some increased awareness or availability to accept this. And we see sort of similar things with psychedelic drugs, you know, um, not to get too off topic, but this idea of, of expanding this consciousness, having some sort of experience where it's almost like everything shifts and it can do so really quickly uh, because it's like some light bulb going off, like, ah, oh, now I get it. And what that is for each person is a little bit different. It is, however, really profoundly focused on, on connection, on something larger than themselves, some insight into I'm not alone and this all has meaning. Have you ever had a near-death experience? Not no, not a real near death experience. I have things that have happened where I probably have embellished it a little more than than it should be. But no, nothing not a real experience where I can be like, man, just a second later I would have died. I definitely have some situations where I can think of and say, like, oh, I could have died in that situation. But nothing were like my life flashed before my eyes or anything like that. Uh, you know, the couple of times I will say that I, I think I've been the scariest uh, have been driving a car. I had the brakes go out in a car one time on like a, as I was uh, getting off of a freeway ramp uh, heading towards a busy intersection. That was pretty scary. Like they weren't working when you hit on them at all. Yeah, like, you know, you get off of, of a freeway exit going whatever. I think I was probably going 60, 50 miles an hour. Uh, saw the light was red, uh, so I started to brake, and there were no brakes. Luckily enough for me, uh, and I was 17, I think, at the time. But lucky enough for me, uh, it was three lanes, and I got into the far right lane, which was a turn lane, was able to take that. I was honking on my horn, and miraculously enough there was no oncoming traffic in either direction going east or west because i was heading north and uh, i went right through the intersection and uh, stayed on the service drive and was able to come to a stop uh i don't know maybe a mile or two down uh maybe like a half mile down but uh so it was, it was super cold and it was an older vehicle and apparently the uh the brake line froze obviously throughout the day and there was, uh, which I don't know even if that's possible, but that's what I was told. And uh, there was a hairline crack in it, which was, you know, obviously froze the brake line. And yeah, there was no anything getting to the brakes. Man, I really want to try to like make, find a way that this could be your fault, but it seems like it actually might not be your fault in this circumstance. Do you feel like anyone has ever tried to contact you from the grave? Like, do you feel like you've ever had an after death communication, like some relative or some person that you knew. Did you ever, have you ever had an experience like that? No. And I, I don't really believe in, in any of that either. So that probably doesn't help because I'm not open to the fact of, you know, if, if the wind brushes my arm, you know, I think it's my grandma or something. I don't, I don't really believe in, in, in anything like that. But, okay, let's just assume that you did. If you assume that you did, would you ever, do you think, like, any any experience that you could possibly say, oh, like, maybe? Yeah, I mean, if I believe in that kind of, I'm sure. I'm, you know, I could be in the in the minority here. I'm not a spiritual person. I, I'm kind of a, is a realist the right word? You know, I think you die, and that's it. You know, you don't go to north or south. You don't come back. The only thing I will say is I'm on the fence about reincarnation, but I don't think I believe in people or, or things trying to reach you from the other side. I can never tell if I'm trying to convince myself that I do believe in something or that I don't believe in something. I go back and forth. Like I feel like, man, there's got to be something else, but I don't know if I really believe that or I'm trying to convince myself. And I don't know if the opposite is true, that I do believe something and I'm trying to convince myself that, no, I think you probably just die. I just go back and forth. Say say you were to pass away uh, tragically, would you come back and haunt somebody or would you just come back? Say you had to come back. Would you come back and be a haunting ghost 
You know, or would you be like one of those cool ghosts, like the chill ghost? I would be more like a jerk ghost. I think I that's how I would go, right? Like I would come back and only kind of just slightly mess with people that I knew. Yeah. You know, like I would move your keys, <laughs> lock you out of your car, like just do little things like that, right? Just things that would annoy people. Oh, yeah. Without a doubt, I'd want to be the haunting ghost. Are you kidding me? Yeah, it would be fun to haunt people. Scare the shit out of everybody all the time? Yeah, but then, like, what do you... There has to be some rules. If there is an afterlife, right, there's got to be some... Like, somebody's got to have some rules into place as to when you can be watching people. Right? It can't just be the honor system. Because you can't just have grandma and grandpa up there like, what was Nick doing at 3 o'clock? Well, you don't want to know. <laughs> Stop looking, Dorothy. How creepy would that be if your family is like there's an afterlife and they're just like around you all the time? Like, yeah, we know how much you, we know what you've been doing. Okay. All right. Are you ready? You ready to move on? Yeah. Are we, are we not, really, not uh, die and go into the afterlife, but. Yeah. I would prefer not to at this moment in my life, but uh, all right. Are we ready for some shout outs, 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 outs? So are those chairs behind you, or is that chair... John has been working on his basement for the last six years, and now he's trying to show off his basement. He's like, oh, my basement's done. Actually, I, I haven't so are those word, chairs, actually, or are those, like, lounging chairs? Those are lounging chairs behind me. Okay, okay. Looks like the kind of chair that you buy to make the place look nice, but not the kind of chair that anyone will ever sit in. Uh, I will say yes and yes to both of those things. Uh, all right, uh, some shout outs here. Uh, George Potsko, Dalton Dugan, Double D, I love it. Uh, Luke Jones, Steve Morgan, Chris Barron, Isaac Johnson, John Briscoe, Chris Brown, but not the Chris Brown, but that's still all right. Uh, Philip Zengas and Cody Putnall. All from. Uh, you don't hear a lot of Daltons. Not a lot of Daltons. And, uh, you know, the, I was thinking about that. I, there's uh, Cody, right? We have a Cody on the list this week. Cody seems to be a really popular name for some reason now. And I, I don't really get it. I don't really understand why. I mean, it's a good, solid name. It's it's like the names that I named my children in the sense that they're traditional names, but not the ones that you hear all the time. Like Logan and Riley. Like, okay, those are both traditional names but they kind of phased out for a little while and they're coming back like mason jackson i'm not a fan of jackson's in general but those names are coming back <laughs> all right are you ready because i got a couple of bangers for you uh which one of these are you more likely to try bangers and mash or unicorn meat well, unicorn meat doesn't exist. So what is oh. unicorn meat, actually? Oh, it's it's made by a company. Um, you can buy it on Amazon, and uh, I, I'm not really sure what it is because it really doesn't say, but uh, it's a uh, obviously a rainbow-colored uh, spam-looking can, and uh, there's some kind of meat on it with uh, green sprinkles. So, Well, bangers, what's bangers and mash? Isn't that so that's a British thing, I think, right? It is, yes. If I'm not mistaken, I believe it's mashed potatoes with like sausage and onions, maybe some gravy. Um, oh, sounds sounds like you're gonna have a long day. <laughs> sounds good, but then like the rest, of, like how can you accomplish any? I could never understand people who eat big breakfasts. Like to me, the um, whole day is over. I'm I'm getting to the age now to where I find if I have a, a decent sized dinner, I'm falling asleep within minutes. Yeah. People who aren't experienced that once you have like hit a certain age, probably like 30, 35, any downtime that you have, you're basically just going to fall asleep. <laughs> it's kind of depressing because I have all these. We talked about it heading into the new year. What are your resolutions? What are we going to do? I've done nothing so far that I said I wanted to do. Mine was to drink water. And I honestly don't know if I've had like a glass of water since the beginning of the new year. Like, just had a glass of water. Oof, really? Not not hangover water. Hangover water doesn't count, but just like, you know, it's 11 o'clock. It's 11 a.m. I'm just going to have a glass of water. It hasn't happened yet. Someday. Maybe by the end of the month. 
All right. Well, I mean, I hope so. You have half the month left, so. It's a big be... challenge, though, man. It's hard to drink water. We'll, we'll be pulling for you. Okay. okay. Uh, say you're a fan. Well, we can. It doesn't matter what sport. But say you're a fan and you uh, invade the field of play. What do you think should happen to you? Should you get the shit kicked out of you? Should you be banned forever? Should you get the shit kicked out of you and banned forever? Or you, you just don't... What's the circumstance, right? Like, am I running on there and they're, they're yeah. still playing? Or am I charging the field with everybody else? No, no, it's uh, you're charging alone. You, you don't have to attack anybody, but you disrupt the game. Uh, what do you think? I, I say this a question because... Over the weekend, there was three separate sporting events that had different fan interactions in which they either tried attacking somebody or they just disrupted the game. And I'm getting kind of sick of it. I, I'm, I, I, this is what I think. If you're going to sell beer and alcohol at the station, at the stadium, and you're going to inclu- encourage people to tailgate, then you have to accept that this is going to happen, right? Nobody can be up in arms, clutching their pearls, so upset, like, oh my gosh, I can't believe we provided all this alcohol, and then someone ran onto the field. You don't get to have it both ways, right? That is a part of the game. This happens. Everybody deal with it. Oof. If you run onto the field, though, like, those are professional athletes, don't, don't be surprised if you end up on the losing end of that one. But I don't feel bad for anybody that like runs on the field. Quite frankly, I enjoy it. And everybody else enjoys it too. I, I mean, I hate it. And I, to be honest, I kind of wish when I see it happened or happen that whoever that is gets what they deserve. I don't want to say death. I don't want that. But, you know, a broken leg, yeah, I don't broken th- arm. I don't think they should die. I think that's no, it's a little extreme. No, but I just I think it's becoming it's part of this world we live in where people think they're entitled to do stuff. Like, you know, that used to be sacred. Now I I saw it happen three times in a weekend. Like it's nuts. It's insane to me. It's entertainment, man, right? Sorry you don't get to see a nice curveball thrown from the mound and you have somebody <laughs> you have to watch somebody run onto the field. I'd much rather see the, that happen. I would much rather see people run onto the field than the actual game half the time. That's more interesting. I don't agree with you, but I, I see what you're saying. Uh, also, baseball's ridiculous. The contracts are out of control. And mark my words, in five years, baseball may not be a full-time sport in America. Okay. Well, that's a ridiculous opinion. Uh, that's fine. Um, all right. Let's see what uh, what our f- faithful uh, v- listeners voted here for us to talk about today. Uh, so the choices were... Is this going to be your new setup? Is this going to be where you are in the basement, or are you going to move it around? Uh, I'm not... I'm, no, this isn't final. My final is going to have uh, better lighting, obviously, uh, and it will also have... You know, like probably some some things behind me, like some sports memorabilia, maybe some podcast stuff. All right, so uh, the choices were uh, The Last of Us TV show season premiere on HBO last night, based upon the uh, pretty famous video game. Uh, Kim Kardashian, apparently it's rumored that she may run for president. That's not scary as hell. Uh, there was a tennis player at the Australian Open has started. And uh, this tennis player withdrew during a match, uh, and he's he's Greek. That doesn't really matter. What does matter is he uh, withdrew. He's, he had some knee pain. Doctor comes over. For some reason, they just decide to drain his knee on the court, and all this mucus goes everywhere. Oh. All this. All this. Uh, it's not mucus. Act. I mean, I don't know what it is. It's all Whatever this knee fluid. Yeah. And it's just fucking disgusting. Um, but none of that uh, won miraculously. Um, what did win uh, was Lisa Marie Presley dying last week. So, what is she actually famous for? Besides being the daughter of is she Elvis's daughter. She is the yeah. She is his only. Well, oh boy, she was his only living child. But did she actually do something, or is she simply famous just for being that? Yeah, I mean, didn't I, she I marry in... Michael Jackson? Yeah, so she married Michael Jack. She's been married four or 
I got I to gotta stop saying present. She was married four times, obviously, to Michael Jackson, and then right after that to Nick Cage in the uh, mid-'90s. Man. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah, which, which led me to a question, which is, do you think it's harder to be like how she was, the only child of a legend or legends, right? Because her mom is pretty famous, too. Uh, you know, just not Elvis, but, you know. Um, Who is her mom? Uh, Priscilla Presley. Uh, what's your question? Like, would I rather? No. So so, so what, what's harder? Being, you know, a, a child of a mega superstar and basically knowing you're never going to be known as your own person. You're always going to be known as somebody's kid. Or being a childhood icon and having to live with that, per se, like Macaulay Culkin or a, you know, Justin Timberlake type. I think probably it might be easier to be a child star, even though their lives don't really seem to turn out very well. I think at the end of it, at least you can say like, you know what? I really did this. I kind of did something on my own as opposed to always living in somebody else's shadow. I feel like that would be a lot, a little bit more difficult is to always live in someone's shadow. Like when your name includes someone else's name in the obituary, right? Like Lisa Marie Presley, daughter of Elvis Presley. Like, oh, I think that you feel like you're never your own person in a way. That would be that would be difficult. I, I really think it would be. I mean, I think it opens doors. I don't think you would disagree with me on that. But also, when you get through that door, right, then everyone expects a certain something. And, may, and I'm just using her as an example. Maybe she wasn't a great singer. Maybe she wasn't a great entertainer. But automatically, people go, oh, she's Elvis's uh, daughter. She has to be a fantastic entertainer. There's only like one or two people that I can think of right off the top of my head who were children of famous people, whether it was actors, musicians, athletes, where the child was more successful than the parent. The only one that I can think of actually right off the top of my head is like Kobe Bryant whose dad played in the NBA. Oh, the Currys, Steph Curry, I think his dad was a famous. I, I, don't, I don't think that you can, I think sports, I don't think they, um, what's the word? I don't think it's fair to include sports in, in, in this conversation. Uh, you can't say it with like Charlie Sheen or Martin Sheen. Martin Sheen's still probably... Maybe not the more famous, but I would think people would say he's probably the more talented actor. Man, I can't think of anybody in like music or movies who the kid is is considered to be quote unquote better than the parent. I mean, I I think it's debatable for like Miley Cyrus and Billy Ray Cyrus. She was definitely maybe not more talented. I don't know like their music, but she was definitely more famous than he ever was yeah well i don't really want to have this conversation about the cyruses but i, I just say I, I i feel you almost you almost feel sorry for uh for somebody like lisa marie presley who you know i'm sure she had a great life and she had everything she ever wanted and all the money but when it comes down to it i mean what i mean what's that gotten her i mean nothing really in the end she's just gonna come back as a ghost and start haunting everybody yeah, you think she stays at Elvis's mansion? Stay at Graceland? Do you think she's going to go haunt uh, Nicolas Cage and do nothing but scare the shit out of him for him being I don't think you can't lover. even phase Nicolas Cage at this point. <laughs> I don't think so either. Man. That's one you know of the what? people, like, if we're going to talk about celebrities that I'm not sure are actually human beings, that I'm not sure they're not aliens, like Nicolas Cage, Mark Zuckerberg, Elon Musk, I don't think those are actually real people. I think that those are, like, aliens. Elon Musk for sure, Tom Cruise for sure, also an alien. Okay, are you? Are we in our top five? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, so our top five is top five. Michaels, who's your number five? So I want to ask you this real fast. Was this like I thought there'd be way more Michaels on you know on a on a, on a scale where I was like, man, number one's going to be super hard. Number two is going to be super hard, but really. I think there's one Michael that stands out, and then it's everybody else. I All think right. that there's a very strong battle for the top two Michaels, 
But then it's definitely not as like the the bench isn't as deep as the Georges, where you could make an argument for a lot of different Georges as being in the number one, number two, or number three space. Michaels is a little bit more top heavy. But if you look at it, like I found some like okay, all right, those are pretty good Michaels. What's your what's your number five? Uh, my number five is Michael Kors. Who? Michael Kors, you know the designer. The famous designer that every woman has a purse or a handbag or something. That's an actual Michael? Yes. It's an actual person? Yes, it is. a. I believe he's an American. And yes, Michael Kors. Oh, I just assumed that was a brand. I didn't know it was actually a real person. Okay. My number five is Michael Bolton. He is a talent. There, he look. That's a guy that is incredibly talented. That for some reason got a bad rap in a couple of movies. But Michael Bolton is a musical prodigy. Listen, his music to, is incredible. It's just not cool. You don't have to say anything to me. I love Michael Bolton. I, I mean, you know my friend group. Like I am hated on for my music tastes, and he is he is one of them. I mean, I, I love Michael Bolton. I think. And not only, I'm like, he should have been my number five. But regardless, if you look at him throughout the years, right? 80s, 90s, well, early 90s, he was a, a sex symbol. He was an icon. He had maybe one of the most underrated male voices in history. And then he changes his tune, comes out with some Christmas albums. He hooks up with the, the Lonely Island, comes out with some fun songs. Like, the guy has changed throughout the decades. And he's still relevant. Who do you think wins in a fight, though? Michael Bolton or Kenny G? <laughs> hmm. Thing is, I and uh, uh. I think Bolton wins, but I bet Kenny G is sneaky. See, I was gonna say I think I think Bolton like leads the Vegas line into the fight, but I I, I think Kenny G is a strong underdog. I could see that actually. I could see like a lot of people like, "Hey man, that's Michael Bolton," and then it's just him getting wrecked by Kenny G. It's a shame. God, like, you know. I would pay so much to see that fight. I haven't paid. I have not paid to see a professional fight, whether it's boxing, MMA, whatever. I've never had, but I would pay to see Michael Bolton versus Kenny G. I don't know why, but I just got the urge to create a new segment for the show where we kind of have like a celebrity death match topic. Where we just talk about two famous people and who would win in a fight. God, that'd be fantastic. We could actually start doing that. We should. Starting from right on now, we will now take submiss- submissions from people about this celebrity versus this celebrity. Who's your number uh, four? All right, so I have a tie. Uh, Michael Schumacher, the Formula One great. Um, once again... He might not be that well-known in America, though I think he is, but worldwide, he's just a superstar. And then uh, kind of my dark horse of the list, but I feel like he deserves a spot, and that's Michael J. Fox. My number four is Michael J. Fox. People forgot about him because he's had health issues, but he was big. Uh, Doc Hollywood, Back to the Future movies. There was that TV show, he was Spin City or something like that, I think it was. He was a big superstar, and apparently he's just a really nice guy. Well, and I mean, and just because, right, you're, you're famous doesn't mean you have to be famous for being famous. I mean, he's also done a lot with the Parkinson's Foundation. He's known worldwide as kind of an ambassador for the disease. You know, he got the disease as kind of taking his life, so to speak, but like he's turned that into a mission to help others, so... Good for him. Formula One super fan. But is Michael Schumacher more famous than Michael Andretti? Uh, ooh, that's that's tough. Um, I'm only going to say yes because of the era, the eras that they competed in. Andretti was 60s, 70s, maybe a little bit of 80s. Schumacher was 80s, 90s, 2000s, and now his son is involved. So, and... Andretti's still kicking it around. He's still in business, so to speak. Uh, there is a there is a cloud hanging over Michael Schumacher because he got into a, a skiing accident, but his family nor anybody will let anybody in to talk to him or see him or or have a picture leaked or anything. So it's like, what is Michael Schumacher? Is he is he still? Do we know that like do, do people is he one hundred percent still alive? 
Oh, that's that's the other thing too. Like, uh, but no, he's 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 obviously some kind. He has some something terribly wrong with him in brain damage wise from that accident. And they've never let a reporter in the house. They moved him from the hospital to to their home where his wife takes care of him with doctors. Um, his son's never slipped up in an interview. His daughter's never slipped up in an interview. It's 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 just an enigma. That's crazy that that's never come out for somebody who was that famous. Man, that's got to be pretty. Yeah, that's a, that's hard to do. For sure. To not have anybody ever say anything, and he must inspire some fierce loyalty. Um, uh, are we at my number three? Or your number three? My number four was Michael J. Fox. Yeah, so that means I'm I'm up. Uh, so my number three, and once again, I think there's three choices for for these three spots. Uh, I, I really think one and or two and three could be interchangeable, but we'll see. Uh, so my number three, I have Mike Tyson. Okay. I forgot about him completely. My number three is Michelangelo. Oh, wow. You went way back on that one. Um, You'd actually have to make the argument now that I think about it that Michelangelo is easily number one. His what? name has survived for I don't, I don't even know oh. how long. Yeah, but I mean, the, the the thing about him is I feel like he f- he fell into the Andretti thing. Like, yes, his name carries on, but it's not that relevant outside of a niche group of people today. Uh, I, I think if you were to ask 100 people on the street, wh- you know, when, when, Michelangelo, when Michelangelo's name is brought up, what do you think of? People will say the, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle before they ever say the artist. The dude was born in 1475, and people still know his name. I, that's probably one of those people that people know who Michelangelo is, but maybe not. Dude, he painted the Sistine Chapel. Now that I think about it, like, yeah, it's it's him. It has, like, this is, we're talking 800 years later, and people still know his name. But anyway, that's, I feel like that's kind of a cheat answer. So let's just move on to your number two. Uh, so my number two, and I think this is going to surprise some people, and I think, I hopefully when I say it, you'll be like, oh, of course. Uh, but Matt Groening, the creator of The Simpsons. Your number two is the creator of The Simpsons with Michaels? Uh, Are you serious? No, hold on. How could you not have those two people at the top? The argument is which one of them is greater. And I thought that's what you were going to go. And you say the creator of The Simpsons? The list I was looking at had his name as Michael. It's definitely not Michael. It's Matt. It's Matt uh, Groening. Yeah. All right. Let me let me rephrase that because let let me go back here. Let's edit all that out because that was an, an error. No, you on my deserve behalf. every bit of punishment for that. My number two. <laughs> I know. I was looking. At the, I was like, wait. I'm pretty sure it's Matt. Uh, all right. Back on to the list there, where I think I can um, uh, depend on. Uh, my number two is Michael Jackson. Okay. So your other one then is is Michael Jordan, I'm assuming. Yes, yeah. two and one. I have those reversed. I have Michael Jordan number two and Michael Jackson is number one. Because even though Michael Jordan is Michael Jordan, I don't think he's Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson was probably the more famous, and his music will still live on while Michael Jordan... I, I think that most people... I think more people were impacted by Michael Jackson than Michael Jordan. I think Michael Jackson is number one, and Jordan should be number two. I have Michael Jordan above Michael Jackson because of whether you choose to believe it or not, uh, I feel like reputation, when you're when you're battling over one and two, um, you know, Michael Jordan is remembered for not only basketball, but also a shoe brand that is global. Michael Jackson is known obviously for being a talented musician, entertainer, but he's kind of tainted now with, you know, whether it's accurate or not, um, you know, maybe being kind of as not a very good person. So I, I feel like when Michael Jackson is brought up nowadays, it's not really about his music. It's more of like, Oh yeah. You know, the, what he did in his past and how terrible he was. But when you think of Michael Jordan, it always comes up. Is he the greatest basketball player of all time and his shoes? 
Yeah. Okay. I can buy that argument. I can buy that argument, but I would say that if let's say they had the same reputations and Michael Jackson didn't ruin his reputation, I think he would be bigger. They both were popular at the same time. Uh, obviously, I think Michael what Michael well, Michael Jackson was more popular in the early '90s. Uh, probably he probably was, but Jordan has stayed into an era where social media is everything. So like, he's you know. How many people are tweeting about Michael Jackson today? And how many people are tweeting about Michael Jordan or Instagram? Well, I mean, one of them is like, well, Michael Jackson is dead. Yeah, I mean, I'm just... You know, that kind of changes it a little bit. I think we can agree on this. I think Michael might be the only name where you could refer to somebody only by their first name. Be like, oh, yeah, man, it's Michael. And you might not know which one it is. The only one where you had two first name people like on like Michael, it's Michael, and it could have been either Jordan or Jackson. Who's in your um? Uh, who's in your honorable mention? I mean, to just think on that real fast. Maybe Michaels, but there's only one Mike, right? I mean, that's Tyson, right? Well, no, I think I was. If somebody said Mike, I would think of Jordan actually. Oh, because I, yes, I wouldn't I, think of Tyson by his. I would think of Tyson by the last name. Hurts Tyson a little bit. He's more of a he's more of a last namer than he is a first namer. Um, let's see. Uh, honorable mention. I have Mike Myers, the actor, not the horror movie character. Um, and, and more more or less because of all the iconic roles he's played. He did um, have some like yeah, but those don't no, those haven't really stood up to the test of time. This this I really didn't want to put him on the list, but I feel like he's getting there. Uh, Michael Strahan. No. Um, I think he's more global than you think, man. I really do. I'll give him to- um, I'll give him he's in the top twenty five. Michael Phelps. Sure, but name me name me in, in thirty years if you're not if you don't care about the Olympics. If you were to go into the street right now and, and ask thirty people about, you know, who's Michael Phelps, you might get twenty right answers. I think you would get more right answers about that than Michael Schumacher or Michael Andretti. Not not around the world, I don't think. But I could, I could be wrong. Could be wrong. Michael Keaton. See, once again, I... It's I fucking I, Batman. I, no, I... And I, I think he's great, but he... I, I don't know. I, I, I don't think he would cut it. Michael Douglas. Once again, I don't think so. Like, I'll say Michael Caine is more a more known Mike than either of those two. Not Michael Keaton. Maybe Michael Douglas, but not Michael Keaton. I think you're I think you're selling short the globalness of certain people. I think that I can't listen to a guy who put Matt Groening on the list. 